Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know, and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors. Today, we're happy to introduce you to Winter Mead, co-founder of Operator, one of the world's leading VC accelerators and which, since recording, has rebranded to now be operating under Cool Water Capital. So sorry for the confusion this might cause. Winter has also authored the book, How to Raise a Venture Capital Fund, the essential guide on fundraising and understanding limited partners, which is a thorough and enlightening read for any emerging VC. So do go and check that out. Want to be on top of who the best up-and-coming emerging VCs in Europe are and maybe even invest with them? Register for our newsletter at theemergingvc.substack.com and be the first to get in the know. Winter, welcome to the European VC. It's great having you. How are you today? Great. Thanks, David. Good to see you. Andreas, good to see you. Awesome. I'd like to start talking a bit about your book. To those that do not know it yet, it's entitled How to Raise a Venture Capital Fund, The Essential Guide on Fundraising and Understanding Limited Partners. I'd love to have you start by sharing with our audience, why did you decide to write this book? So what was the journey to you know start thinking about it and effectively going out and writing it and getting it done? So my background is as an LP, a limited partner, investing into private equity funds and venture capital funds primarily. I did that for a number of years. And as I was doing it, that part of the alternative investing landscape became much busier, right? And so when I started my career, I really felt like you could count (laughs) everyone that you would do serious diligence on, on two hands. Year over year, it just became more and more unmanageable to do that as there was new fund formation there were new investors coming to market. It started to feel like as an LP, which again, like investing into, for example, venture capital funds, which are investing into the founders, it felt like the market was getting more and more out of reach, right? So I would pride myself on trying to meet with everyone and anything that was interesting in the market, just to have like really good context to make you know better investment decisions as an LP investor. That was becoming harder and harder to do every year, right? Just because the market was growing and venture was becoming more than a cottage industry and really becoming more mainstream. I've been doing some thinking, you know, over a number of years is trying to, and I guess some actions as well, trying to be helpful to VCs, both established managers and emerging managers. And I guess I realized that the gap was more on like emerging managers. There's just this whole yeah. knowledge base that wasn't accessible by this emerging manager class. When I started to try to help emerging managers, I think this is probably similar to other people's stories, right? But when you start to get the same question over and over and over again, you start to realize that maybe there's another way than just kind of getting on the phone and answering that question. And so the thinking over a couple of years was like, what is something that's more scalable, that's more accessible, that doesn't necessarily require like another 30-minute phone call? For me, like the interesting piece was writing the book to share some of that knowledge in the hope that it would be helpful to emerging managers. I knew I wanted to coach more emerging managers. And so it was also like a challenge to myself to see what did I know? What could I actually authentically help emerging managers with? And what didn't I know as well? And kind of give me maybe leading information that I could focus on and kind of iterate on and become better at. So like I could actually give better advice for some of the gaps. So I think the book is good. It could be better. And so, yeah, I I love the feedback. Does that mean Uh, second edition coming? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's why we're doing this podcast. (laughs) Coming coming soon, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) For months or years. (laughs) If I should maybe uh, say what Winter, of course, can't say on this podcast. I've listened to it on Audible, of course. I listen to all my books instead of reading them. That's because I'm a bit lazy and I've got two kids in a household that I have. To manage so it's more doable that way get an hr <laughs> yeah exactly and i definitely have to say it's the most comprehensive introduction to how vc firms actually are structured and how they are raised and the whole dynamic in the 
process with LPs and how you should think about getting ready and everything. I don't think I've seen anywhere anything nearly as comprehensive as your book. So in that sense, it has my warmest recommendations for all our emerging managers to have that under their pillow, to listen to it or read it, even though that it is, of course, primarily focused on the U.S. situation and the dynamics there, but I would say 90% of the takeaways are directly applicable here. Thank you. Yeah, that's very kind. There's reading the book, right, and getting the information, and then there's the actual process of building it out and doing it. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll get there, but, you know, what I've decided to do with my time is focus on, you know, building this ecosystem out. So the book is very foundational from that perspective where, yeah, you get this information and then what do you do with it or how do you use it, yeah. right, to actually like raise and build a fund? We should try and tie that, I think, to your main gig, which is operator, which is the YC of VC acceleration. I'm curious because operator, there you're focusing on emerging managers that are going to become an institutional managers, going from being only a family office fund, proof of concept fund, to actually being able to raise institutional capital. Whereas I would more position the book as for the first group, meaning emerging managers, just getting ready and understand what is this game. Yeah, I think that's fair. And maybe that's a telltale sign as well of kind of like how the ecosystem can expand. And it is with this mindset of how can you help at scale, like in a market that's changing. And again, it's trying to give people that potentially did not have the access to this knowledge base or this information in the past to give them kind of a leg up in the beginning parts of that journey. With the risk of asking you to comment on your competition as well <laughs> to operator, but how do you see the landscape of VC acceleration? Who do you see doing good things, which programs are relevant for whom? Do you have any thoughts on that? I haven't gone through the other programs for <laughs> obvious reasons. Yeah, of course not. Um, of course. <laughs> haven't applied either. Hopefully they would accept me. But building a fund is really, really hard, right? I think you have to be in it for the long term. You have to be in it for the right reasons. And I think culturally, that's who I'm looking to align with as well long-term oriented thinkers, people that really appreciate kind of the struggle of early stage company building and like financing, you know, those companies, working with gritty founders. I mean, there's a lot of time that happens before things become obvious in VC, right? And there's a lot of iteration that goes into that. And there is like a lot of struggle that happens, right? And that can be mental, you know, maybe it sort of reaches into physical, a lot of like trying to solve like bigger problems. Like that's what VC is all about, right? It's trying to tap like big market opportunities. And I think the capital markets piece of that is exceptionally important, right? Like you need the lifeblood of companies in the early days is, you know, product and engineering expertise and other skill sets. But, you know, it is capital as well to kind of build out that talent, and that team and make sure like you can build a product and, you know, test it in market. So it's like, who are the people that are taking that risk? Like who are the emerging managers that kind of understand the context, understand the environment they're investing in? We have people that are in it for the long run that aren't afraid to build a platform, right? They aren't afraid to build a firm. It's growing up, but they treat it like a craft. Like, you know, I need to get really good at my craft. I need to learn a ton. You know, the more I know, hopefully the better I can manage this fund and do my job as an investor better. So it's kind of like trying to find people that kind of th that resonates with um, on a cultural basis. I've been doing this for 10 years now, and I still feel like I'm learning stuff every day, right? And invested now in about 85 funds as an LP. I've worked now with 77 funds through this program, which is not a huge number, but it's, I think it's quite a big number, like relatively for, you know, just understanding the mechanisms of how a fund is actually built. And I'm still learning. I'm just like, wow, how have I not gotten to the end of this road yet? And so again, I think that's driven maybe by the fact of lacking a few, few more neurons and some other people. No, I think it's more driven by venture is innovating. It's changing. Structures are changing. Markets are changing. There's different market dynamics innovation by definition is like new things, you know, coming to life. And again, like capital markets being built around kind of those new trends. And you need kind of investors to kind of follow those areas, like, and try to like seek out those gaps. And so I think right now, like you mentioned it, right? Like this community is more focused on investors that are going down that traditional path, trying to understand what it means to raise a fund, to build a firm, to raise institutional capital. 
But I think, you know, the world of venture is changing now where there are other structures. There are strategies that allow you to have investment vehicles that don't follow the traditional, you know, fund structure. And so thinking through that and learning that, right, like it opens up the possibilities of how to help investors. Again, if the big picture thing here is you're super valuable to founders, you have really good judgment and insight and can build conviction in kind of these newer technology investments, like who are those people? They don't necessarily need to go down a traditional fund path, but they do need to really understand like the mechanisms of fund building and firm building, fund management, these concepts that really help, in my opinion, create alignment between LPs and GPs and GPs and founders. Exactly. As you say, there are so many things happening that are allowing emerging managers to not just go out there and raise for a traditional fund right off the bat. So we have uh, SPV investing, which is deal by deal, much more possible, doable now than it has been before. Then you have Angelist with rolling funds. In Europe, we have Vauban, who allows you to be raising for a fund with it being open-ended for quite a long time. So you actually almost have what is an evergreen structure. I'm thinking, Winter, what are your perspectives on this and how would you or how do you advise emerging managers when it comes to picking structure and getting underway in their undertakings as emerging VCs? I think it's a way to build track record, right? Like there are more ways in today's market to build track record. And then you have to make the business decision as an investor, you know, of where you go from here. Like, do you keep on being a syndicate lead, you know, do you keep on running SPVs? Do you raise a rolling fund and then do you keep on raising rolling funds or do you eventually structure into a traditional fund? Or do you have enough reputation and interest from investors, friends and families, or otherwise that would invest into a traditional fund structure, you know, uh, more on day one? So again, like these are all kind of independent business decisions that need to be made by kind of investors that want to be VCs. But yeah, there's definitely a number of new ways, like over the last five, 10 years, you know, new software and platforms and whatnot that have allowed people to just build up in a meaningful way, like track records. You know, if you're an angel, you're kind of learning on your own dime for a while. And that's like an indication and a signal to maybe other people that would invest into you where you'd be managing their money that, you know, you're really committed to doing this, you know, not necessarily full time, but you're committed to doing this seriously right? And building investor judgment and trying to differentiate and help founders. So I view it as a positive. There is a market mechanism at play here. That's kind of, you have lots of investors, lots of angels, lots of people building initial track records. And the market kind of, I think, sorts for that in some ways of like who starts to demonstrate, again, long-term orientation to the asset class, who starts to demonstrate like full-time orientation to becoming like professional investor, professional VC. As time plays out, like you start to have the quote unquote market kind of bubble up like really interesting investors. And again, I think that's been true over probably a longer period of time than just the last decade, but the last decade has reduced the barriers to entry. And so it's just much easier to make in investment today, cross the T's and dot the I's and build that initial track record than it was in the past. And so, you know, again, like these lower barriers to entry create access to the venture class. More recently, I'm trying not to take like an opinion on like what's the right way to have the right investment structure. But I think it really starts with like, what is your strategy? And what do you need to do, from my opinion, to create alignment with your LPs? I think that's helpful with a traditional fund structure, but I think there's other, like you're saying, ways to do that that also create alignment with LPs and give LPs more choice and accessibility, You know, which I think is a net positive for founders and for the venture ecosystem. I'd love to shift a bit now and deep dive into operator more in detail. So it's an eight-week program, uh, court-driven. I'd love to hear you expand a bit, Winter, on what's happening during the program, but also it's a community above all, right? So I guess that what happens after the program is equally, if not more important. And I'd love to have a quick rundown by you. Yeah, so right now, the way it's structured, it's an eight-week program for full-time VCs, who have indicated interest in becoming institutional, right? So what does that actually mean? It means understanding, in my view, like it means understanding the LP perspective of, you know, what are institutional operations? Like what are institutional best practices? What does it look like to 
have an institutional fundraising process. You don't necessarily need to have that, but I think there's some good information you can tease out from just understanding how that process works. Like even if the reality is you may not raise institutional capital at fund one, understanding how that works, I still think is very important. And understanding, you know, how to manage all of that, right? Again, like I think the equivalent here is, you know, you might be able to build a really good tech product, but can you actually run a business? I see those as two different things. Like you can be a good investor and you can kind of miss the forest for the trees when it comes to having other things in the right place uh, and managing the fund well. And I don't think it's like a hundred percent correlation here. Like I've been challenged recently on this where it's like the most institutional firms are the best investors. You could definitely find like case studies where that's not true. But I think the bigger picture thing here is being able to tease out like good or best practices and kind of how well-run firms have done it in the past, right? And learn from history, learn from historical examples, learn from kind of best in class and borrow those for like what you're building as an emerging manager, right? Because I think those are more interesting pieces. And the underlying assumption there is that you're not just like copying what someone else has done in the past. Like you're borrowing things that are low hanging fruit, again, best in class processes, procedures, systems, and you're able to actually build a differentiated investment strategy. You know, those are two different things, right? Like alongside of this kind of like very well run institutional firm. So the program is meant to be like very high, very intensive exposure to just a lot of things that you might not necessarily know as an emerging manager, or you might not necessarily have been exposed to if you're, you know, an operator in your prior life or just an angel investor, you know, coming from another industry. You might have some exposure if you're at a current platform, like an established VC platform. It feels like pretty consistently. And again, this is the cohort-based program, like 63 funds have come through that program so far. And the consistent feedback is, yeah, there's a lot more knowledge than people realize. Like there's a lot more kind of management involved and a lot more pieces to it. Again, like if you're just doing venture investing, you're not necessarily exposed to the institutional side of that. And again, like it's not saying that you need to be an institutional VC to be like a great VC with great performance, but it is saying that there's a lot to learn when it comes to like that body of knowledge that can help inform how you build like a great firm. Just to nail that down, what kind of AUM and headcount is operator relevant for? Yeah, so I've experimented here a little bit. I haven't only done VC funds, but I've done growth funds and debt funds, done domestic funds, domestic to the US and international yeah. funds. Mm-hmm. The consistent feedback is like it's relevant to everyone <laughs> that's come through it so far. <laughs> In the past, it was really focused on kind of early stage venture, and it still is largely. It's uh Like if I had to put a number around it, which I don't like doing, but I'll do for heuristic sake, it's kind of the sub $75 million fund size, right? The smallest fund has been a $5 million target. The largest has been a $200 million target. The average has been around $30 million target. That gives you a sense of who's in the community. And again, if you're just starting out, like the reality is very few people are going to be able to raise more than 50 million in venture. The other reality is if you're just starting out, you're more likely going to start out at the early stage. And therefore, like your fund size isn't going to need to be as big. Based on that community, it's more of an early stage community of smaller funds, of fund one, fund twos. About 80% is fund one. And the remaining is, you know, after fund one. Maybe we'll dip into fund zeros at some point. At the very early stage, it's very much about hustling to be able to actually run a VC firm with $5 million in AUM or, or $10 million. There's not much management fee to play around with. And as you talked about firms, it's much easier now to build a firm because you can do it through a decent VC tech stack, build from a lot of good software, but also some very good service providers. Could you put some words to how you think about the back office of an early stage fund? I grew up on a farm, so 1% of a $10 million fund is actually a pretty good salary for someone that's <laughs> working pretty hard. That's one perspective, like relatively... I think if, yeah, you're a finance person and you're... I've definitely met investors who didn't have that perspective. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Most people, yeah, if you're coming out of finance, if you're coming out of like established VC and you're raising 10 million, then maybe relatively, you know, you're you're stepping down into a salary. 
But I think for most people in the world, that's an exceptionally amazing rate of pay. So maybe there's like a level of entitlement there to think about. The point stands of like, what is your budget for raising a fund? I think is more like what you're getting at. You know, there's different ways to think about that, right? Without getting into too much complexity. Like there are certain things that are going to be defined by your limited partnership agreement that allow you to, right, expense things by the fund if you're able to get into business. So it's not like all of the dollars that you spend on, building your investment structure are going to be out of pocket. For many people, the focus should be on the longer term. So I don't think the market has changed so much in terms of timing, where it's not like you can get into business in like two weeks versus two years. It's still like it's going to take you realistically like a couple of years to get into business. How you smartly spend your time and your capital, you know, sort of in advance of that. One thing to think about, like if you're an emerging manager and there's a lot of kind of emerging manager listeners to the show, one way is just to say like, you know, raise the five or 10, get into business. Like, I think that's probably the common advice. Most people just say like, get into business as quickly as possible. But another way to think of it is like, what have you actually built or what do you actually do that's like truly differentiated, right? Or truly like an unfair advantage, that's another way to frame it, right? So it's kind of like, well, if I build my track record, right? Like we were talking about earlier, lower barriers to entry, I build my track record. Then there's just like more data I can point to like three years later, which I totally get and it's a total valid argument. The other approach there is, do you have a unique skill set? Have you built something that's like truly an unfair advantage to you and kind of your firm strategy? I think a lot of people try to avoid that question, like at least emerging managers. They're more focused on just like getting into business and kind of raising the capital and deploying capital versus like really trying to work on kind of what's the differentiated skill set they have that's going to help founders or be sort of, you know, net positive to the ecosystem. So just another way to frame it. I actually think that that's a super important point to draw out because we've had fund of fund investors on quite a few times now, and they always say you need to differentiate, you need to be different from all the others who they see every day. And then the counter question from emerging managers is always, uh, well, um, how to do that? Because you know, I'm just investing in 12 companies over five years, divesting them over the next five to seven years, and I'm doing it in deep tech just as everyone else in Europe. To me, that shows that they're thinking right away about their investment strategy and thinking that's their differentiation. But it's just as much the infrastructure that you might pluck your fund into. So the network that you've built and, and prepared and the uh, community that you might be running or have been building through different partners. Am I correct in assuming that that's how you think about this? Well, how you can actually build something up around a fund that isn't yet established? Is that the way I should understand what you're saying? Potentially, yeah. I think it's harder to differentiate on portfolio construction or structure is what I was hearing from you. You know, I know there's some talk recently about, you know, more VC firms restructuring as RIAs and, and giving themselves more flexibility when it comes to, you know, long-term investments or, you know, investing outside of what's been traditionally defined as like a VC equity investment. So, I mean, there is some differentiation you can get through structure in today's market. I think that's less common. And I still think like as an LP, you're going to be assessing, yeah, what people view as like an unfair repetitive advantage. An analogy that may or may not hold that I'm testing out for the first time is like, if you're a seed investor, right, or a series A investor, and you're investing into a company, and you're investing into a founder, like you always believe that that founder knows more about the company than you do, right? Or like that usually I'd say is the bet. And you say, I'm the investor, like I'm smart, you're the founder and you're smarter. And you should be much smarter because like you're fully immersed in this like day to day, right? And so it's almost not on the investor in that scenario to like figure out what is differentiated in that particular market that the founder is going after. I think if you were to apply that analogy to like LPGP, the LP isn't trying to figure out on a day-to-day -day like what the new market opportunity is. Like what they're doing is betting on an investor that's built out some structural advantage, not the fund structure, but uh, necessarily, but like, you know, some market advantage or like you're saying like community advantage or network advantage. And they're, they're kind of making that bet 
on the actual VC because again, like LPs see a lot of different permutations of funds. Like, and so a lot of stuff after your hundred, you know, 500th pitch, a lot of stuff just starts to sound the same. And so what you're really looking for is like someone that's actually grasped a true market insight or has actually formed, and I think a lot of people conflate, you know, thesis and strategy, have actually formed like an investment thesis on something, right? And haven't just said like, oh, that smart investor over there is doing it, right? Like they've actually iterated on something and kind of figured it out. And they kind of bring that to market as like the fun product, like I'm going after the space. And again, if they're right, like maybe they have a couple of months or a couple of years to kind of play it out, like if it's actually truly different. But if they're right, like other people are going to like follow in- into that space, right? And so I think those types of thinkers are pretty interesting. I think they're harder to find, right? They're the hidden gems of today's market. Like they're harder to find because there is a lot of noise, right? There are people trying to figure it out. They might figure it out, but it might take them a little bit of time. But it's those truly like original thinkers. They're original, but maybe they also got lucky in terms of like where they were playing or what skill set they developed or like what market they're playing in. They've kind of had enough self-awareness to say like, oh, I can form an investment strategy around this like market gap. Or, oh, look at this, like I've been building this thing kind of organically. And now I have this defensible community that other people can't replicate just overnight. And so I think that's something that LPs are looking for, maybe your question. I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but I think it's like, that's what they think about when they're thinking about like, what does a differentiated fund opportunity look like? And it's very hard, you know, and this is what I try to do like in the ecosystem that I run is like, I try to provide that perspective to managers around like, you know, if you meet with a thousand managers, which is probably roughly like what I've met with in the last year, Like you kind of get market perspective on what's out there, right? Like how do you actually kind of position yourself against other opportunities that are out there? And then, you know, as an emerging manager, if you're not talking to a ton of other people in the market and you're kind of focused on building your own business, you might not get that perspective yourself, right? So you're kind of saying like, this is so unique. I know this is original, but the LP has met with 10 other people, you know, over the last month that are doing something similar and they're saying it in a similar way. I don't know if there's advice to follow that other than, you know, try to have a good degree of self-awareness, be a good listener, listen to feedback, especially from LPs and try to truly like challenge yourself on the different pieces of your own investment strategy and say like, you know, what is the actual one piece of my story that is truly different, defensible, and can be repeatable over the long run to allow me to capture value in my future funds. I actually think that what you said there had a super good point, which was maybe a bit hidden, which was as a GP emerging manager, you want to go out and pitch to the fund of funds, even though you know that you're probably not likely going to get money from them. The first fund, you'll probably be doing friends and family offices already close to you. But the feedback that you can get from the sophisticated fund of fund investors that are spending all their time investing in managers, that can be quite insightful for an emerging manager. It doesn't have to be a fund of funds per se, but I do think Fund of funds are professional investors, especially if they're a VC fund of funds. Like their job is to meet with many managers. And I do think they have good perspective. I think the other piece there, like if you you know extrapolate beyond fund of funds, it's just who has experience investing into other VCs, like and who has talked with a lot of emerging managers. Like those can be family offices, those can be endowments. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a fund of funds per se, but yeah, someone that really understands the space and has seen other opportunities and listen to what they actually are saying, like write it down, process it, think about it later on. Yeah. Try to find people too, that will give you actual feedback. Winter, we are running out of time and we always like to end our episodes with what we call a quick fire round. So that's quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. Are you ready? I'm never ready for these types of quick fire <laughs> rounds, but I'll try my best. We can always edit it, right? <laughs> Question one, in venture, what areas excite you the most that other people don't really feel that excited about? Technical challenges, like who are the right emerging managers that have the right technical skill sets to go after what people would probably call like deep tech bets. And that can run the gamut across, you know, space or healthcare or kind of, you know, other sectors or industries. 
second question, which is what are your three top tips for emerging VCs who are fundraising? The one key piece is like, just be super critical of yourself and really challenge yourself, right? On what is the truly differentiated thing that is like the one thing that you have that no one else has, right? And just try to figure that out. And hopefully there is an answer there. If the answer is like, I don't have anything yet, then like, what are you actually building? Like, and can you, again, have the self-awareness to acknowledge that? And then the vision to kind of paint like where you want to go and, you know, measure those milestones as you get there. And again, like LPs can kind of follow along with that. And if you start to grow into that vision, like you'll probably get some really excited people along for the ride. Third and final question. What can we expect in the future from Winter Mead? Version 2.0 of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Will it be an ebook with animations? <laughs> it is trying to find like these diamonds in the rough, right? Like the hidden gem people that maybe they're on a global basis, maybe they're still in the US. Like I think this untapped crowd of investor that doesn't necessarily, like I see a lot of spinouts from established VCs and there's a you know good proportion of them that come through the operator program as well. But it is trying to find, again, people that are situated that know and have a passion to like be an emerging manager in a way that's like, I think, well aligned with the founder, trying to find those people. Like if they're out there listening to this, like reach out to me because I think like helping them getting more of those people into the community is, is super interesting. Because again, like I've kind of been in, you know, Silicon Valley for the last 12 years, like I've tried to work on, you know, building a network and I think a lot of Silicon Valley and a lot of technology is built on kind of network effects and having a good network. But it's some of those people that I think are product geniuses or they're, you know, like I said, super technical and they don't have necessarily like this exposure to what was and has been and, you know, it's increasingly becoming mainstream, but it's still kind of like this niche industry, right? And they don't fully know how to like break into that industry. I think those are the interesting people that could, you know, bring differentiated talent into kind of this emerging manager world. So I think, you know, future of what I'm doing is, yes, trying to track down those hidden gems and, yeah, provide them infrastructure, provide them context, provide them help so they can uh, hopefully be additive. It's awesome, Winter. That's very uh, close to our heart. So we uh, definitely hope that we have a lot of people listening in and saying, ah, Winter Meet, I'll reach out. I want to be part of Operator. Winter, thanks so much for joining us today. It was awesome having you here. Before I let you go, I have to ask you because we had Christian Hernandez who raised the uh, $270 million first time fund wow. in Europe. Uh, yeah, that was quite amazing. It was a bit of a cheat because they were all uh, uh, very successful managers in other funds before, but still quite impressive. But he had Che Guevara behind him and I was looking at that picture all the time during our interview and I see that you have Lucky Luke or something like that. Could you explain what's going on there? It's just Don Quixote. Ah, it is Don Quixote. Cool. And why? I like the picture, the horse, the person on the steed, the sunset. I don't know. It's just kind of like a a magical, it's a rug actually. Ah, it is? Yeah. I don't know. For me, it's like a magical picture. Yeah, I like it. I've been mesmerized here, so I definitely dig it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome winter. It's relatively new. I hung it in the last week. So. Uh, nice. <laughs> <All right. laughs> thanks for coming out. Yeah, of course, of course. Now, thanks a million, Winter. Thanks a million. Take care. Thanks, Andreas. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors.